So we've looked at Elijah, we've looked at Moses, and we've looked at Deborah and Esther and all these great people in the Bible, John. And what we saw was wonderful examples that did great work for God and people we can learn from. Now we're coming to the one that they all bowed their knee to. Now we're coming to the one that, the name that is above every name, the ultimate victor, Jesus. It's hard to put together a sermon that could equate to all of who Jesus is. The Bible says that all the books in the world couldn't tell us how wonderful he is and describe all the great things that he has done, and he does. But I'm going to attempt to do it in 30 minutes here. And I'm going to start with this writing by a fellow named James Francis. Jesus had an amazing impact with his life. He's a true historical figure. Listen to this. It's called One Solitary Life. The author says, here's a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30, and then for three years he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never owned a home. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place that he was born. He never did one of the things that contemporary society would consider a sign of greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He had nothing of this world, only the power of his divine manhood. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him, another betrayed him. He, is, he was turned over to his enemies and he went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on this earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone, and today he's the centerpiece of the human race, the greatest source of guidance and divine inspiration. And the author says, I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, and all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned, put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as one solitary life, Jesus. That was written by a follower of Jesus, but I want to read you something from the president of the American Historic Society, not a believer. And he said, no other life lived on this planet has so widely and deeply affected mankind. So we're talking about the greatest impact in the history of the world. This man made it. Who is he? The Bible says that Jesus is God's son equal with God and fully God. Jesus is a member of what we call the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's infinite and he's eternal. He did walk this earth, but he was God come to the earth. And the word says, the Bible says that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the anointed one. I like to anchor the sermons to one text. I use lots of scriptures, but I like to take one text and have it lead us and guide us through with the flow. And today, that text is Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And it says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Verse 2, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed. And here's the three points for the sermon. They're going to be in this text right here. Whom he appointed as the heir of all things, to whom also he created the world. Jesus, it says, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the, power, by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So let's take a look at what that says. Three things we're gonna pull from those verses 
to learn about Jesus. And the first is this. He's the all-powerful, almighty King of kings and Lord of lords. In Revelation, he's coming back. He's coming in power and strength to rule the world. And it says in verse 16 of chapter 19, on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hebrews 1, again, back to the text, says, but in the last days he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed heir of all things. He's over all things, through whom he created the world. So let's look at that for a moment. Hebrews 1, 3 says, through him and by him all things exist. Mark Batterson, in one of his books, The Grave Robber, wrote about the creator and the beauty of what God had done in creating this world. And I want to read from you what he said in that book. He said, you may feel as if you're sitting still right now, but it's an illusion of miraculous proportions. Planet Earth is spinning around its axis at a speed of 1,000 miles per hour. Every 24 hours, planet Earth pulls off a celestial 360. We're also hurtling through space at an average velocity of 67,108 miles per hour. That's not just faster than a speeding bullet. It's 87 times faster than the speed of sound. So even on a day when you feel like you didn't get much done, don't forget that you did travel 1,599,793 miles. And you did that through space. To top it off, the Milky Way is spinning like a galactic pinwheel at the dizzying rate of 483,000 miles per hour. I find it interesting that some people want to believe that what this earth has become all started with an explosion where gas oozed up out of the earth and all, of, you know, and over time this evolved. Man, it takes a lot more faith to believe that than to look at something so complex. I mean, really, we're moving at, at 67,000 miles an hour and we're not dizzy? I mean, I get motion sickness pretty easy. And that's the reality is God's created it where everything, and the, the oxygen's just right, our bodies are amazingly complex, but what God has done reveals, well, here's the deal. Jesus did this. The Bible says Jesus is the creator. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1.16, here it is. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. There's no authority or power higher than, greater than, the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So, think about this closely now. I want you to know it's absolutely true. He has authority over all nature. He has authority over sin. He has authority over sickness. He has authority over evil. He has authority over death. And you know what this means for you, this all-powerful creator, God, Jesus Christ, loves you with all of his heart. All this power is available to you. All his love is towards you. His heart is towards you. And this means that he can deliver you from any problem, that he can heal you of any disease, deliver you from any addiction, and heal your wounded heart. Do you know who he really is? This Jesus. Ephesians 1, verse 19, we've heard this many times, but as we think about the earth and all power and all authority, as we speak of Jesus and who he is today, let's look at, light, at it in the light of this word. Verse 19, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now listen to this. This is the word. He's far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything 
else. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. Nothing or no one is over his head. Every other authority is under his feet. This is a big deal. Why are we so afraid? We're afraid because we feel like things are out of control. Not only out of our control, we wonder where God is. What's going on? How can there be war? Well, the Bible said that there'd be wars and rumors of wars. It's all prophesied. It's all heading towards an end where he will take complete control. And he has that now. But he's choosing to let people have a chance to find him. Did you know, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but did you know it's historically recorded that more people turn to Jesus as their savior during times of war than any other time? That's been recorded throughout history. And you say, well, it's all getting worse. Well, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. The Bible prophesies all this. But you need to know that he's got it all under control. That he's in charge. That he knows what he's doing. That he loves you. And he knows what's going on in your life. And you can trust him. I was just talking to someone today who mentioned to me that often when they thought something was bad that happened in their lives, God used it to turn it to something good. For instance, they wanted a job so bad and they didn't get it, they got another job, but in just a few months, the old job went away, the company dissolved, and they've been in this job for 17 years. And it all looks like it's bad in the moment you say, God, where are you? He, distrust him, walk with him, protect him, seek him and you will find him when you seek him with all your heart. No other authority is greater than his. Okay, so listen up. Trump is a chump compared to Jesus. It's true. He's just like us. He's a human being. Biden's memory is minuscule compared to the all-knowing Jesus. For that matter, well, I better not go there. Okay? Do you fear anything? Jesus says, fear not, because I'm with you. It's not that those politicians aren't bad or aren't smart it's just that they're not really in control they're not God's in control no nuclear power can defeat Jesus no government can control him he has all things in his hand and at the right time he will move and all things will be made right the Bible tells us this He's only waiting to give time for and allow that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's merciful and long-suffering and he's giving opportunity. He has all power and all authority. And if you remember that, it'll take the fear out of some things. He's the Prince of Peace. But he's got all power in his hands. Secondly, one of the things we see all through the Bible is that Jesus is our example. I mean, Christian initially meant <clears throat> in history that they were Christ-like. If you look at the definition of Christian, it's Christ-like. <clears throat> Hebrews 1.3 says this about Jesus. He is the radiance, we're back to that text now, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So if you want to know what God looks like, we can historically see a life that was lived. And as a matter of fact, it was God who came down to be a man. This is our example. We see the way he lived. We see the way he walked. We see the way he loved. We're his disciples. That's what the Bible says. If you're a follower of Jesus, and I like that term, people say Christian today, and it doesn't mean anything. It's something historical in their life in a home they were raised in. But when you say follower of Jesus, I like that a little more because it, it, it brings it home to what we're really all about. What does disciple mean? The standard definition is a disciple is someone who adheres to the teaching of another. We're adhering to the teachings of Jesus. It's a follower. A disciple is a learner. We're disciples of Christ. We're, we're, we're learners. And he is the one who teaches us. He is the example we're following. Ephesians 5.1.2 says it for us. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant 
aroma. So there we have it. He's our example. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 4, 7, and 8 that God is love. So love is that pursuit. We saw love coming down in Jesus Christ. God come down. And we see our example in the life of Jesus of how we're to live and love is the goal. But people are watching. If we don't follow Jesus, we can create some problems for people being attracted to Jesus because we're his followers. Like, if you're raised in a home, you kind of take on some characteristics of that home and that, that father is a great influence. If you look at the lives of some pastors, I'm just talking about example, and you think, well, all sin falls short of the glory of God. That's true, that's true. But it's also true that we can walk faithfully. The Bible asks us to be faithful. Would God ask us to do something we can't do? Faithful isn't perfect, but you're, you're faithful. You're following, you're learning, you're growing. You're becoming more and more like Jesus every day. Faithfulness. And when we're not faithful, look at, look at some of these preachers who've sinned and their sin is exposed. You know, they're national leaders that are well-known and visible because of television and, and all the mediums of communication these days. Now I ask you, have, have they hurt us when we share about Jesus Christ with others? I'm just gonna be honest with you, they have. Now, let me tell you that I love them. I want the grace of God to go to them. They're people too. I want them to have mercy. And behind the scenes, I'm the guy going to these guys if I know them, okay? So I, I love and I know Jesus loves. But nevertheless, have you heard people say those, those people are just hypocrites? That preacher was a liar. They're always after money. And isn't that one of the things we're facing all the time when we're trying to share Jesus? When we don't follow the example, we can't see the beauty of who he is. And people, we need to know that God wants us to show his love and faithfulness in such a way that people can trust. Not in us, but we lead them to him. And people are watching. Just like our kids watch, they'll take on our characteristics, right? When my son was an, a little guy, just to illustrate this, we're driving along, just he and I in our caravan. Do you remember those? Are they still around? He was just five years old. He's an adult now. And we're traveling along and I must have been oblivious to what I was doing because Aaron, my five-year-old, says, Dad, how come you can pick your nose and I can't pick mine? What do you say? So I said, oh, look, a horsey. Just, you know. <laughs> Another time, like you don't pick your nose. Give me a break, all right? <laughs> when no one's watching, whatever. All right, move on. This isn't working. <clears throat> We're traveling down the road, this time with Karen and Aaron. He's just one year old. Candace wasn't even around then. And we're just cruising down the highway, I-5 on a Sunday, not a car in sight. And Aaron from the back says this from his little chair. One year old, he goes, come on, lady. <laughs> and I look at Karen and Karen goes. <laughs> I said, hey, at least I don't cuss, you know. <laughs> but man, they're watching. Maybe we got it right somewhere because when he was about a year old, she brought him out and I was working in the yard in Kaiser, Oregon many, many years ago and sun was setting. It was a beautiful evening and she brought little Aaron up and she said, Aaron came to get a kiss good night. So she leans him over and I kiss him on the cheek and I said, I love you, son. And he said, I love you too, hon. <laughs> like, okay, some, we're doing something right. You know, we're, he's getting it. We love each other. We love him. But the whole idea is he did everything right and we're trying to take on his characteristics and learn and grow. And we're image bearers. We're trying to bear his image so that people might see and follow the right way. First John 4, 7 says this. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Now see our love, see it here, it's not just about being kind and good, but it's about sacrificing 
for the sake of the kingdom. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So he has done this. He's shown us the way. The Bible speaks of his love and his example that that we might walk in these things, that we might love that we might forgive. Jesus forgave us. You know, one of the main reasons that God wants you to forgive people is because it will bind you up and mess you up if you don't. You say, well, those people hurt me and they don't deserve forgiveness. Well, forgiveness from you is not saying that what they did is okay. There's a misnomer there. Forgiveness means the root of Forgive is to give forth, and it means to give forth to God, which means that I don't require anything of someone. They don't have to do the right thing for me to be okay. Did you know you, could do, you can be okay even if they're not? If you need them to do the right thing and they never do it, what does that mean? That means you can never be okay. But you can. You can. You can have peace in your heart. You can have love in your heart. You can follow a different way. You can speak from your pain to others who can find out about love that sets you free. But if you're bound up, it just makes you negative about life. It makes you bitter towards life. It hurts you in relationships. You don't want to move forward anywhere. God wants to set you free and he's setting you free when he asks you to forgive others. Give it forth to him. Let him take it. Take him off your hook and put him on his. He's righteous Even though he's merciful and full of grace, he's also a God of justice. And in time, he'll take care of it. He's merciful and his anger is slow because he doesn't want anyone to perish. But he will take care of it. Give it to him. And if you forgive, you're showing that you're like him. How about kindness? Gracious words were on his lips. One of the things that concerns me about the political atmosphere that I'm seeing Like, I'm a pretty conservative dude. I'll just tell you that, all right? You might be surprised how conservative I am if you talk with me behind the scenes. But I don't like to really bring politics out here because I want to keep it on the word and I want to keep it on the gospel. That's what I will be judged for when I see him. Now, I know that righteousness exalts a nation. And so I I want God in our nation. I really, really do. But let me tell you something. I'm very concerned about the anger I'm seeing in the name of Jesus about the lack of kindness. Hi, listen, I'm all for boldness. I'm all for courage. But do we really do away with the fruit of the Spirit to show people who God is? Or would it be better that we look like Jesus, that we're not intimidated by the things that are going on in this world? We can be courageous and bold, but we're still loving and kind. And love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the pursuit of God. For our lives. We're following Jesus with those things. And it doesn't mean we can't be bold, but we certainly shouldn't be mean-spirited. All right. Just threw that out there. Let's walk in love and mercy. In righteousness and truth, but in kindness and forgiveness as well. He's all these things, and he wants to show others what he's like through our lives. I read a story about a missionary in the early 1900s, Earl Stanley Jones, and he was traveling through Africa and he got lost. And he found a native African and said, can you help me? I'm lost. I need to go to this destination. He said, yes, I can help you. He said, follow me. So the missionary got behind him and he got out his machete and started hacking his way through the jungle. And the missionary got nervous. Because there was no path. And they're just digging deeper into the jungle. And he said, are you sure you know where you're going? And he said, yes, I do. And the missionary said, well, I don't see a path. And the native African said, out here, I am the path. Follow me. He knew where he was going. It reminds me of what the Lord spoke to me years ago when I was walking this property. He'd done that several hundred times and prayed. 
The buildings of this, the walls rather of this building were not up, but gravel was being poured and we were just in the early beginnings many years ago. And we had fallen behind for 12 straight weeks. The budget had been overrun, which, which makes you nervous when you have oversight in these things. And I was feeling the weight of it and I was just praying and saying, God, help us, I'm trying to follow you and I don't, I don't really know what to do all the time. Please lead me that I might lead the direction you're going. And I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, just get in behind me. And I got this picture of Jesus just standing in front of me, but his back was towards me. And he was moving and God was saying, just get in behind me and follow. And it took a burden of leadership off because really when it comes to God, leadership is really followship. That's what it is. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And so I, I got it. I, I just need to get in behind Jesus and find out where he's going and move with him. And that's true for your life too. He's the path. He's the only way to the Father. He's the only way to salvation, it says in Acts 4.12. But he's the path for your life. Where do I go next? Just get in behind. How, how do I make a living? I lost my job. Just get in behind. Talk to him. Listen and follow. He's the path. 1 John 2, 6 says, the one who says he abides in him ought also himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And the third point this morning, he is our redeemer and our healer. Let's look at the text again. Hebrews 1, verse 3, after making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Why did Jesus die? I want to read to you again something written by that theologian James Francis. And he says, listen closely now, why would the Lord of the universe, God in the flesh, allow himself to be captured, falsely accused, tried and condemned, whipped, stripped, and nailed to a cross like a common criminal? The answer is simple because he loved you and me. All of us at times have done wrong have been unloving, unkind to others. And the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The worst thing about our sins is that they separate us from God, who's absolutely sinless and perfect. And in order to bring us to God, Jesus, the sinless son of God, took the sins of all mankind upon himself. He took the punishment of our sins and suffered the horrible pain of death by crucifixion. He died the death of a sinner that through his sacrifice we might find forgiveness and freedom from our sins. Our sin had separated us from God and there was such a great chasm that he's so altogether holy we can't cohabitate with him. God's so holy that sin must be punished. Eventually it will be. He's slow and he's patient because he's so loving. But someday Jesus will come back on a white horse and he'll set things right on the earth. And it speaks of him as a great warrior. That's another thing I want to talk about at another time. People don't want to hear about Jesus on a white horse coming with destruction to set things right. But that's in the Revelation too. Another time on that one. He's all powerful. He's no man be pan be powerless man made up in the minds of people. He's in complete charge. But we're so separated in a supreme act of love, the, the sin, the punishment that our sin deserves, yours and mine, was meted out on him. God's just. Sin must be punished. And in an act of his justice, which is part of his love, he let the punishment fall on Jesus so it wouldn't fall on you and me. Wow. He took what I deserved that I might be free. That's what Jesus did for us. The Bible says that he's the savior, the deliverer, the redeemer. He died on a Roman cross for our sins and that he truly is the savior of the world. 1 John 2, 2, he's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. There's no other way. 
It's true that all roads lead to God, but it'll lead to God as Jesus Christ is the judge and you'll either hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter in, or you'll come before God and you'll hear him say, depart from me, I never knew you. To eternal destruction, that's what the Bible says. Whew. But God has made a way through Jesus. Acts 4.12, he's the only way. You say, why is he the only way? Why is he the only road? Because he's the only plan of God the Father to bring about a justification and forgiveness of sins. You, you can't tell God what to do. He, he does what he wants to do. And this is what he chose. You can't create God. You can only discover him. He created you. And in that discovery, you'll find that he made a way that you, you might see his mercy, his love, his forgiveness, his grace. I think one of the amazing things about Jesus that speak of the reality that he, it's, it's true he says who he, he is who he says he is, is the transformation of people. When they come to Jesus and how there can be a complete turnaround in character. You've seen it a hundred times. You may not have known it in some people's life. Let me tell you about one who had a transformation. My dad, Ray Russell, he died about four months ago. I miss him. Man, he encouraged me every Sunday. I'd go back and he'd tell me what a great preacher I was. We lived in the same house. That, that was nice. Because you don't always feel like you did an awesome job when you step away from this pulpit, just say it. But I miss going fishing with him. I miss his affirmation. I miss his smile. I miss his embrace. But I'm grateful I'll see him again. And you, you know him. He was a pastor here for 15 years and attended here for about 25 years. Many of you know him well. But I'm not sure you all know about the, the transformation that took place in his life. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about him today that you may not have known. He was abused as a young man. Didn't go well in his family life. His dad traveled and was gone all the time. His mom was not nice to him. I'm just going to be honest with you. She, she beat him with boards. She locked him in a shed as punishment. That's hard to say about your grandma, but that was true. She called herself a Christian. If that's what a Christian was, he didn't want to be one. He left home after his dad died at 15 years old. And he was angry, an angry young man. At 16, an engine blew up in his face and it caught his body on fire. So it marred his face and his chest. He became a fighter. He's running from God. Couldn't find love anywhere. He would fight at the drop of a hat, and it turned out he was pretty good at fighting. He got into alcohol, and he had trouble with alcohol in his youth. He had trouble with the law in his youth. Somewhere along the way, as he got a little older and got married, his heart started to look to God again. And just when things were about to turn around and he was ready to embrace him wholeheartedly, my mom and he lost a 22-month-old son, Eric Ray, in a house fire. And the pastor locally told my mom and dad that if they would have been living right, their child wouldn't have died. So now... Dad's back out again. He's like, well, that's who God is. But the problem was that's not who God is. He doesn't take your life. He wants to save your life. And he had a rough go for about 30 years of his life. But eventually he did come back to Jesus he gave his whole heart to Jesus. He started to follow in Jesus. And the greatest thing I could tell you about my dad was the transformation that Jesus made in his life. 
He stopped drinking. He was there with us all the time. He was a good husband. He was a great dad. He became a great pastor eventually. For 60 years of his life, he was faithful to the Lord. See, you walk into this place and you might see someone and say, wow, you know, I can't be as good as all these people. They've all got it together. And the truth is, you have no idea where we've come from. I stand here today because my dad walked towards Jesus. My dad took the hand of Jesus. and He said, lead me out of this. I've hurt myself and I've hurt others. Jesus, I'm in behind you. Show me the way. And he became a great man of God. Jesus forgives. Jesus is merciful. Jesus is loving. Jesus will save you. Jesus will heal you. Jesus will redeem you. He has all power and all authority. And he's here for you today. I want you to bow your heads and we're going to pray. Father God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for coming to earth. Holy Spirit, thank you for illuminating this reality. Only you can take it to the hearts of women and men. It's just words except the word of God anointed by the Holy Spirit goes to the hearts of people and we can know, we can see, we can feel it. You're real, it's true. Jesus, you are God come down, God who made a way for us. And we thank you today. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I wanna ask you this question. <clears throat> Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal savior? Have you invited Jesus into your heart? Are you following him with your life? If not, I want you to know he's here for you. He loves you. You say, man, I've really messed up. Hey, you just heard a story today, man. We've all messed up. But God loves you. God will forgive you. And God will give you heaven as your home. And he'll lead you out. Out of the pain. Out of the misery. Out of the lostness. He's here for you today. With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, I'm gonna ask you to lift your hand today if you wanna invite Jesus into your heart. He's, the Bible says he knocks on the door of your heart. That's what he's doing right now. And the Bible says that if you will open your heart, open the door to your heart, that he'll come in. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, his forgiveness is yours. But he's reaching to you today. On the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to lift your hand if you wanna pray a prayer to invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life. What you're saying is, Pastor, I'll pray with you, but everyone in this room will pray too. I'll lead you line by line. Everyone will repeat it together. We don't want to single anyone out or embarrass them. We don't want to embarrass you. But if you're ready, he's ready. He's here for you today, and he'll come into your heart. I want you to lift your hand if you want to pray with us and invite Jesus into your heart on the count of three. No one looking around, a moment of privacy. Lift your hand if you're ready to receive Jesus. One two, three. Just lift your hand high if that's you. Okay, God bless you and you and you and you and you. Let's all stand to our feet. People are coming to Jesus today. Maybe I didn't see your hand, but God sees your heart. Everyone pray. If you mean it in your heart, he's coming like a flood into your life to love you, to bless you, to give you eternal life and to help you through life. Everyone pray this prayer with those coming to Jesus. Say, Father God, please forgive me. I've sinned and I've made a lot of mistakes, but I believe that you love me. I believe that you gave your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. Jesus, come into my heart and make me brand new. I'm going to follow you with my life. Thank you for saving me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.